to give a little bit of a, of a background of our story. Um, one of the biggest dams to be built in Africa was built in a small rural area, village in Lesotho, just like one of these villages. Uh, this is where the dams are built. Um, our story uh, follows a 70-year-old widow. Um, her husband and her children, uh, her daughter and her grandchild died years ago. Now she's survived by her son who works in South African coal mine. Our opening of the film starts with Mando waiting in front of her house, awaiting the arrival of her son from South African coal mine. It's a Christmas day. Um, before this day, Mando was counting days, um, weeks, months, hours. Now the time has come for arrival of her son. As the bus pull over uh, approaches from the distance, she began to urinate and enjoy a celebration for the arrival of her son. But as soon as the bus pulls over and, and the passengers step out, she realizes none of them is her son. And then her face began to transform into sheer terror because she knew that something happened. And the messenger, when they arrive, they tell her that her son has died in a cold mine accident. When her husband and granddaughter died, she cried and prayed and cried to God, and she was comforted. But now that her son is dead, she remained silent. She confined herself in her grief, and as if there's a wall of bewilderment has risen between the old world, the world and her, nothing said, nothing spoken can come through her. And every night, she put on the radio station that broadcast uh, the obituary of those who passed on that week. And then she will put on, on her, when she goes to bed, she'll put on a, a, a Victorian, like beautiful dress when she goes to bed, hoping that she will die in her sleep. And um, after some time, she intends to die and be buried at the local cemetery where the rest of her family is buried. And then she began to to begin to, to sort her earthly affairs in order. The first thing she does is to go to, to find a grave digger. When she finds the grave digger at the graveside, she's shocked to realize that there's a pile of trash, of garbage, has spread across the cemetery. Furious, she goes to confront the village chief. And, the, and when she's there, she learns that the village is to be flooded due to the construction of the new dam reservoir. And now he chronicles her quest to sort of ignite some sort of, a, um, of people to stand up and to retain their land by reminding them about the connection with the land, like that their umbilical cords and their supply centers are buried in this land, that this is their land and they cannot give it up. Momentarily, they sort of uh, all stand with her in solidarity. Um, but later on, their effort, uh, sort of, uh, they abandon their effort and they are forcefully removed from the land. So, uh, when they go, when the village now is about to leave, they go to the graveyard and tie village, singing the hymns uh, of mourning in procession. And they dig up their graves and they start to move slowly in procession with their, with their loved ones. And then Mandra departure is sort of a reverse with the extraordinary act of defiance when she turns around and breaks away from the procession and um, heading towards the armed policemen who were squirting them out. And then he began to pace and pace towards them. And this confrontation sort of results in a traumatic, in a traumatic um, moment that ends in her death, which is her wish. And, and this confrontation of this her death is sort of it sort of solidify or watched her legend even the years to come. That's why uh, her name now they call her Mandwa the Ziliot. Um, the story is very personal to me because both of my parents come from this place that is now being resettled. And also the few people that I interviewed from this village, uh, the previous village. Uh, they liken this process of separation with their birthplace like, like to a death, like likened to a death. That it's not just a community that they lose, but they lose their identity and this belonging, their memories. 
So when um, my producer Kate and I were first confronted with this project, we were deeply moved and uh, we knew that this project had to be made for two reasons. The first is that many films have been made in the Sotu, but mostly have been made by foreign filmmakers who've come in and made uh, films with aid money around social issues like poverty and AIDS and HIV. And this is the first time that a film will be made by a Musutu-born native of Lesotho, and that's very significant. Secondly, the project resonated with me deeply because both my parents and grandparents from both sides were victims of the Group Areas Act under apartheid, which saw the, the forced removal and resettlement of people based on the color of their skin. So at its core, this film interrogates identity, both individual and collective. It is a film about belonging, the quest to belong, but most importantly also the insistence on belonging. Every day people are moved and resettled in the name of progress and modernization, but at what cost? This is a, a, a contemporary conversation that takes many different forms and shapes, and we can call it gentrification. And this makes this film very relevant to us. Um, I'm very excited to work with Jeremiah. His films are bold and provocative. He's very personal in his stories, and I love how he always shares a part of himself in the films that he, made, he makes. And as a producer from South Africa who's made a number of short films, including a feature film, I'm always excited about artists who, who manage to share a part of themselves in the, in the stories they tell and films they make, but also to, to give audiences a different viewing experience and to make films that can have real impact. And I believe that this project has the right ingredients to do just that. Thank you very much.